Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, our third and final presentation uh, for just this morning, nearly, nearly this afternoon, uh, is from David Ayers. He is uh, the network, sorry, his presentation is, in, is entitled Network Management Challenges for User-to-User E-Research Collaboration. David is a lecturer in computer science at the University of Otago. He does research into wide area distributed systems with particular interest in decentralized security and efficient network communication. Networking topics of relevance to this project include distributed access control systems, encrypted data management, and techniques for integrated provenance tracking of sensitive information. David is interested in tools and technologies that can facilitate decentralized and collaborative network configuration and monitoring, particularly when spanning different administrative domains. So, David. Thank you, Jenny. That was a very good introduction of actually all the things that I really want to get involved with in this project, but which we haven't been able to get involved with yet. Um, I am working with uh, Russell Butson on this project. He has been at the University of, Ta of Otago, one of the key drivers in e-research infrastructure there. Uh, we're not yet an organization that really has an e-research center that permanently exists. We're one that sort of still is at the committee stage, and individual researchers do good work in the e-research space and make progress that way. My interest in this project actually relates to the introduction that was given in the computer science topics in security, but we've discovered there are so many other things that need to be done first. This project and this report has been about that. So the motivation is we have this particular project called the KISS project, it's an infant safe sleep project. It involves collecting quite a lot of uh, medical data, relevant data from infants um, around New Zealand. It's a healthcare study which requires collaboration between a number of different teams and spans different organizations and the, the complete geography of the country. We have some national e-science infrastructure that we can already use to manage data storage, and this has happened in a sort of progressive trial stage in past years, and it's now turning into a production service, very similar to services that have been offered with Australian e-research infrastructure nationally. We wanted to use that. We wanted to use this particular infant study program as a catalyst to try to get non-technologist researchers to try to adopt e-research infrastructure. And my interest, as I mentioned, is to use this as a case study for distributed security and access control investigations. So the step was to move the KISS project to managed network accessible storage. And that's what we wanted to do, but it's presented a number of challenges, and that's really what this talk is about. A lot of the technological needs with respect to this project are straightforward. If you have technologists, you can work with them to set up infrastructure really easily. But the difficulty is how many options there are and actually dealing with the education and the environments that you need to embed this technology within. So if you like, this is e-research for the poor guys as opposed to the HPC end of um, research where you're surrounded by people that can help with any particular technical need you have. The outline of the talk is giving a little bit of a background on what KISS is about, um, talking about the way that uh, the project has used software and some of the issues we've had with transferring data around, then some of the issues we've come across with national network services that have come from this project, uh, and then talking a little bit about how the campus networks work and what we can do to make them perhaps a little bit more special and appropriate for e-research needs. Finally, I would like to say a couple of words about coordinating the service level agreements between different e-research stakeholders. That's been one thing that's been an interesting um, undertaking within this project. So by way of background, the KISS project involves researchers collecting sensitive video and biometric data about babies. So we've got a little screenshot here of, well not screenshot, sorry, a picture of some of the data collection equipment which is packed up in a suitcase used at field sites all around the North Island of New Zealand. It then gets uploaded uh, at the Eastern Institute of Technology, which is also up in the North Island, gets onto the internet that way, and then is provided for analysis at the University of Otago, which is right at the bottom of the South Island, and then the analyzed data is shared back for researchers around the whole country in participating organizations. So 
we cover, those sites indicate the sort of relative, um, relative uh, needs of the different KISS sites in terms of infrastructure uh, throughout New Zealand. In the past, the project operated by essentially querying unencrypted data on external hard disk drives. We've all heard about the USB stick phenomenon with research data storage. This was something that we clearly wanted to move away from because it's not really best practice. We wanted to move to the centralized managed electronic storage, and the researchers in the project saw the value of this. They weren't, as I said, necessarily technologically driven, but they could see that it was a better way of doing things if it could work for them. And if, we now have the National eScience Infrastructure, NESI, uh, which is well represented uh, here at the conference by various, by Nick Jones and others, um, that maintains and develops a data fabric that's very similar to some of the past infrastructure Australia has offered. So this looked like a promising place to try to engage with these researchers, get their data onto this managed infrastructure and generally improve what they were doing. But we have some software integration challenges because a lot of the researchers, they're basically going to be Microsoft Windows desktop users, probably ancient versions that possibly are coming out of the end of their support period. They're not going to have administrative privileges. They may be highly isolated from technical support. So we're talking about people who are going to be bringing these field equipment you know, these pieces of field equipment back perhaps to centres that are at GPs around the North Island. You know, we're not really getting to the sort of place where you can assume you've got a university level technical support provided. So we needed light touch integration of this new practice. We had to make sure that you know, while the researchers were extremely willing to actually engage with this uh, potential, which is fantastic and we really appreciate how much the researchers haven't minded being guinea pigs with this, um, they can only endure changes up to a point. I mean, we cannot get in the way of their workflow such that you know, they're running into technical glitches and interfere with their work. So what we've observed is that quite often the users of the past e-research infrastructure in the country have been quite close to experienced technical support if they've not been technically experienced themselves. And this was something which we were then thoroughly moving away from. So an example of an initial plan was we wanted to try to use WebDAV as a transfer mechanism given that it's built into modern operating systems. We thought we might be able to connect to the data fabric in this way just to get data transfer done. But straight away we discovered that wasn't going to work. It's too inconsistent across the operating system versions that we had to deal with, let alone different operating systems. So we ended up having to step away from one of our first light touch approaches, which was wanting to stay entirely browser based so that we didn't have to start interfering with the software that was running on these different field station computers. In the end, people, the decision was made to actually install a particular client uh, software, BitConnect, to actually do WebDAV transfers into the IRODS infrastructure that sits behind the national data fabric that we have in New Zealand at the moment. But one of the things that we immediately found here was that while, again, technically, that's fine. It gets the problem more or less solved. It has some glitches, but we'll come to that later. The difficulty was for the users. It was quite a foreign environment. It didn't look like the way they were typically managing their files before. So we had this extra step where, for some, it wouldn't be much of a transition. But for the people we were interacting with, it was actually a hurdle to show them a completely foreign interface to what they'd learned in terms of use of computers, even to affect these transfers. Now, you might think that this isn't necessarily necessarily something that you know, should be particularly problematic. One thing that I've actually left out in the background is that the field stations actually collect a lot of video data. So perhaps one of the, the elephant in the room I forgot to mention was that we're actually transferring reasonably large amounts of data. We're talking about 20 gigabytes a week or so of data coming from this particular project. So we're really mixed, unusual you know, sort of not really having great technical support on the field, quite a lot of data being generated, not with respect to the scope of, you know, uh, radio telescopes and all of the other equipment, synchrotrons we've heard about this morning, but it's a reasonable amount of data given that these people mostly just deal with a bit of email. So their, their campus networks or their field networks are going to be significantly impoverished compared to the high speed networks you want for the sort of very high volume, high performance computing e-research. Anyway, that's the main point as to why we had these difficulties. We were really trying to get the sort of light touch, but yet dealing with large data sets. And of course, it's also sensitive data, which is difficult as well. We ran into some interesting problems running WebDAV over the Davis uh, framework, which thankfully we got from ARCS uh, and ran on the New Zealand infrastructure. It actually uncovered some subtle bugs in the underlying storage system, iRODS. Thankfully, Rob, who is here somewhere, I suspect, um, from Auckland, fixed that and actually committed it back to the project. We didn't trace back to what the original cause of the issue issue was, but we had this pathological access pattern coming from this sort of toppling stack of software, all trying to have a light touch approach that ended up really not with a light touch approach at all. Again, if you could start from scratch, you'd build a much cleaner infrastructure and everyone would be happy, but then we'd also have to wait for it to be finished, if it ever gets finished. 
other kind of usability problems that we had here with this work was that we had people being able to see the state of transfer with the actual data management infrastructure before some of these transfers had finished. And again, if you're only dealing with a couple of megabytes worth of spreadsheets or other forms of data like that, you don't typically get synchronization problems where someone thinks they're seeing the data ready to go and starts downloading it. When you're dealing with something like 20 gigabytes over a comparatively slow link, we had the issue that some researchers were jumping ahead and thinking they can access data before it had entirely finished uploading, and that led to some really problematic issues. The software didn't handle very well getting that sort of concurrent data access sorted out. In the end, of course, you can build into a workflow a way of managing that, which is that they used out-of-band signaling. Effectively, you pick up the phone and call the other side when the transfer is finished. Not exactly high-tech, although it does work. But this is the type of thing which we found as a, we hadn't realized that this wouldn't be handled particularly well in the infrastructure as it stood, and it required work to actually get it up to speed to work with what we needed. So we also had some issues with um, the sort of these transfers where sometimes we would find that files from sets of files wouldn't quite be uploaded and we were impoverished to track down what was actually going on because we didn't have a huge amount of logging coming from the client's side. And again, this is a project where the hope particularly from Russell leading this, was that we could just adopt this infrastructure and it would all be green light and everything would work uh, happily and we could proceed with a new way of doing things. And really hasn't been that straightforward. The workflow itself for the KISS project is not that complicated. You know, they have a sequence of steps and they're quite happy to have extra steps put into their list of things they have to do for their sort of weekly uh, affairs of managing the data sets. But what we've had is often the technical solutions that get the features that we'd really like to have, like integrated metadata management, come with a huge kind of pile of extra features that ideally we'd just like to turn off. And so much of this stuff ends up kind of in your face as the researchers. We end up with this educational problem of almost telling people what not to look at, not to touch, in terms of actually getting their jobs done. But we do have some specific requirements. One thing is that notifications would be a useful way of, thank you, building in what we actually want from this particular framework. And that was sort of, again, something we didn't really get particularly effectively. In the iRods project, the um, iDrop framework actually has started to provide a way of doing embedded web applications that hopefully will help with that somewhat. What we also discovered is that we had two classes of user, power users and users that were typically more browser oriented. And that was one of the things that we ended up splitting in terms of which technologies different people ended up using. But when actually getting people to work through a browser, one of the really simple things we ran into, which is it was sort of embarrassingly simple but still a problem, was actually uploading directory trees. Now, of course, you can create zip files and upload single files that contain directory structures. The workflow of the, the actual workflow of the KISS project involved these sort of structures of subdirectories representing the state of the experiment. But we found that really it's not something that you can easily interact with with browsers at the moment. You really do need to create zip files if you're actually going to upload through a typical web interface. Um, when you actually want to deal with a tree of files and folders. And this is problematic if the files are large, because you then end up with researchers having to babysit the creation of these archive files. And unfortunately, HTML5 is definitely not to the rescue. What we ended up actually shifting back to, despite the fact we wanted to have light touch, we ended up not being light touch, and actually trying to move back to the iRod software, the stuff underneath the actual data fabric, its native protocols and the native software that it had that speaks its own language, we found that we ran immediately into a problem with authentication because then we fell foul of the fact that its protocols weren't authenticating users in the same way as the national framework did, and there was a gap in the support matrix where what we needed from one side didn't quite line up from what we got from the other. So there's all of these wonderful standards and so many to choose from, but they don't necessarily give you complete coverage so you can find things that fall through the holes. We were able to work around that at first because the University of Otago were also testing um, using iWatts infrastructure and they were happy to use the native authentication. So we bootstrapped through them and with the node that's going to join the federation eventually that Nessie is running, um, we were able to test out how this software worked. And the conclusion was it worked well, actually. So the iDrop software, the user interface, has lots of wrinkles, but in terms of the transfer, it cleared out of many of the problems we'd run into and we could actually get the researchers doing their work. But then we ran into various network problems as well because, of course, we're operating over a very complicated collection of different sort of types 
types of campus or other types of organizations. For an example here, we had one malfunction in a network card close to one of the data fabric systems. All the researchers saw was that things just went slow um, and that it was too slow to be usable in its current form. But in the end, as I say here, more than 10 network and system administrators were needed across five different organizations to diagnose the fault. So it was a very in interesting case of how you actually federate the management of this e-research infrastructure. And a huge amount of progress has been made to fix that. As a quick depiction, and these slides will be available through the web so you don't necessarily need to look through it all now, we move from the field capture at the top through the actual uploading site on the top right, through the actual data fabric site in the bottom right, then down to the analysis um, point in at Otago University. And I've indicated with colours approximately where the different sorts of speed issues were there. Like sometimes you know, there were speed issues you'd expect, like a slow inter-campus link. Um, other times there were things like this one, which we didn't expect, and that was causing this sort of backlog um, of data for us. So the network failures that we had, what actually ended up being a problem was that the Otago point of presence was flipping us off onto a commercial network rather than using the academic network. That was essentially the conclusion to the problem. But it was an interesting situation where we would have actually wanted to have a case where the system just stopped working, but in fact there was policy in one of the many parts of the network that switched the traffic to a different environment, and it took some unpicking to actually figure out what was going on. So although we're really small scale users, we'd still like to move in this concept of the science DMZ, this idea of actually having researchers that can form end-to-end -end connections at high speed across high-speed you know, networks have provisioning done just for those end-user researchers and work through some of the difficulties that happen in the inter-campus networks. So I'll skip the security of data point and just come to a conclusion to make sure that we don't have issues with launch timing. The KISS project has benefited greatly from the research technology that we've actually been able to get access to. We've had lots of problems with the client-side software, with the network behavior, with coordinating lots of organizations to provide tech support, but it's also been extremely useful because significant progress has been made on all of those fronts. So it's really lined up, I mean, it's not been done by our project, but say Nessie have done a huge amount now to become a coordinating point for support tickets for problems that might actually be with disparate parts of the national e-research infrastructure. So it's been very interesting to see that develop. Um, and like I said, the collaboration is key to re research, but it's quite complicated to coordinate all these concerns between the different organizations. The bottom conclusion, though, is that when it comes to managing the sensitive data, I think we're probably still a little way off. And so I'm going to have to keep waiting in the wings to apply my security research, perhaps to this particular project, as we're still ironing out the first parts. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Thanks very much, David. And uh, it's interesting to see that um, quite often the best laid plans of a, a light touch aren't uh, easily re realisable. Uh, does anyone have any questions for David and his project? I was actually wondering, um, could you do a blend of uh, commercial, uh, commercially available products with um, you know, the research network back end. For instance, something like a, a Dropbox service, you can run a, your own Dropbox server on, the, on mm -hmm. the university infrastructure, and then you'd have the advantage of your clients out there could just be using the Dropbox client, which is fairly intuitive, fairly easy to use, supported by Dropbox, but they're actually connecting to university servers and, and the data stays on there. It's an excellent point. I mean, something like OwnCloud is an interesting project for doing exactly that kind of world where you don't necessarily want a complete commercial um, interaction with those organizations. I think one of the things that we've had is that we're trying to get many different um, sort of cards lined up uh, all at the same time. So given that we're only just beginning to get Shibboleth provisioned throughout the whole country and various other parts of infrastructure are transitioning from their sort of project experimental phase to being actual supported services, one of the difficulties, I think, has been that we would have needed to buy into a lot of commercial stuff to actually get the end-to-end -end thing to work there. And that would have effectively, in this case, been a distraction from trying to get some of these other things lined up. So I think more the project management issue was just not realizing how many things still had to happen before it could all fall together. But you're completely right that trying to give the Dropbox-like experience would be ideal. The only one thing that we want in addition to that is a bit of a better treatment of metadata, because I think one of the risks you run into with the Dropbox idea is that people just end up with the infinite dumping ground and you know, they can just transfer whatever they want. And I mean, these guys are actually pretty disciplined. So we could trust them, I think, to get, if we said it's only the experimental 
directory trees that you're allowed to put through this or that we want you to put through this that actually work with that quite effectively. So one of the things we want to experiment with is actually putting restrictions on what's allowed to be uploaded to almost stop accidental misuse and kind of keep things lined up. We want to do that more with client-side encryption, but that, that's a very well-taken point that a mix of these different types of provisions would be very good. It's just also you, I mean, my experience has been I would have thought so much of this would have worked more smoothly and then you just worry what's going to fall through the gaps when you, <laughs> you put the two things, you line them up and then it's like, oh, oops, oh dear. Uh, Any other questions? It's all. Okay, in that case, I'd just like to ask all of you to uh, thank all of our speakers uh, today for their, their exciting presentations. Uh, so thanks very much, everyone.